enhancing non-aeronautical revenue. I think in previous panel we, we, we discussed some aspect of the non-aeronautic revenue, but we, I think we have the pleasure to have, to have uh, as a guest and panelist some, some uh, specialists on non-aeronautical revenue, and I give uh, directly the speech to Tom. Thank you. Good afternoon again, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, to my mind, even as recently as 40 years ago, the idea that an airport could generate uh, half or even the majority of its income from non-aviation sources was virtually unheard of. And it wasn't really until the late 1970s or early 80s that we really saw a major effort to develop this lucrative revenue stream. Today, of course, uh, the pursuit of non-aviation revenue is standard practice in almost every country. And here in Dubai, it's done very successfully. So I'm pleased to say that we have two gentlemen who are at the center of Dubai's retail activities. Eugene Barry, the airport's senior vice president commercial, and George Horan, president of the Dubai Duty Free, who are both going to make presentations for us. It's a little change to what we've uh, done already. We're moving away from the panel discussion and uh, we'll have the presentations instead. Uh, Eugene, if I could ask you to start. Um, money makes the world go round. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my thanks to the organizers for inviting me here today. Uh, the subject I've been asked to speak about is, is um, enhancing non-aeronautical revenue, why this is relevant, and why it is becoming increasingly more relevant um, in supporting continued growth in aviation. I've worked in the airport commercial industry for about 18 years, and I've always found the term non-aeronautical revenue to be a bit negative, actually. Any description that starts with non immediately suggests no, or somehow is not essential, or at least not equal to the other part of the equation, which is aeronautical revenue. But this may not be the case anymore. By the end of this session, I hope that instead of discussing enhancing non-aeronautical revenue, hopefully we will talk about embracing commercial revenue opportunities at airports. I'm not saying that aeronautical revenue is not important, because it clearly is. The point is that non-aeronautical revenue, new and old sources, offer so much more opportunity and flexibility to tick more than one box in an airport. I mean value, uh, which can be created and added, profitability, service, innovation, entertainment, comfort, and overall satisfaction with an airport. I've tried to make my points as general as possible in this presentation, but I'll draw on the experience of Dubai airports where I think it's relevant. Dubai airports are the managers of Dubai's aviation assets. We run a multimodal business, and we do this with essential partners and operators and commercial stakeholders. It is a 24-hour environment. It is a constantly changing landscape driven by growth. In 2012, we handled over 57 million international passengers. And in March this year, we welcomed over 5 million passengers for the fourth straight month in a row. Over the past 50 years of our history, Dubai International's passenger traffic has grown by an average of 15% per year, every year. All of us in this room are participants in this massive global industry, which impacts inside the territory we manage and also well beyond our boundaries. This is an industry which has become greater in volume terms when you talk about millions of passengers or millions of cargo tons, but it has also become more complex due to competition, globalization, advances in technology, economic change, and social influences. Here in Dubai, we are competing successfully with hub airports around the world, and we're competing for the hearts, minds, and now wallets of air travelers. I would argue that competition has shifted from experience in the air to experience on the ground. This means inside airports themselves. It means the choice and standard of retail, food and beverage, car rental, financial services, lounges, advertising, and a whole portfolio of commercial activities and a whole travel experience must match the emotional expectations of travelers 
and meet the professional expectations of our partners and investors. Airports are therefore, in my view, and in the view of most commercial managers, I'm sure you'd agree, platforms for commerce, first and foremost. Uh, this comment actually was just touched on in the last session, and it traces the evolution of transport in recent centuries, from the days of trading ports in the 18th century, to railroads in the 19th century, to motorways and highways, which were supported by an automobile lifestyle in the 20th century. And arguably, this position is now taken by airports in the 21st century, supported by urban development and changing social influences and affordability. Airports are literally connecting the world. As a consequence of this evolution, indeed revolution, there will be over 3.6 million, sorry, 3.6 billion global travelers by 2016. And this number is expected to double by 2030. This region is leading the way. Middle East carriers have invested over $200 billion in new aircraft since just 2005. And over $110 billion has been earmarked for new airport development here in Dubai, in Abu Dhabi, in the UAE, in Doha, Sharjah, Jeddah, Jordan, and many other places. The Middle East share of traffic has increased from 3 to 11% over the past decade and capacity is increasing in line with demand. There is no doubt that this region is at the heart of a dynamic and evolving industry that is setting the pace and meeting the challenge. And the aviation industry, as we've heard today a few times, is making a significant contribution to local economies. Here in Dubai, Dubai's aviation sector supports 19% of employment and contributes 28% of national GDP. This is the same as a quarter of a million jobs and 22 billion US dollars. By facilitating travel, trade, tourism, the aviation sector will add a further 100,000 jobs by 2020 and will by then contribute a third of national GDP. This is a very compelling justification in itself to continue investing in airports as a business platform. However, uh, I'm not sure if this is the bad or the ugly, but at an industry level, there is a challenge to create a sustainable future. Well, I've identified at least three main business ch challenges here. First, and at a global level, airlines' net profits in 2012 were around uh, 4 billion US dollars, which is a net profit margin of less than 1%. In the four decades leading up to 2010, the airline industry generated net post-tax profits of just 19 billion dollars, which is a margin of 0.1%. Airlines are clearly competing very aggressively now since the emergence of low-cost carriers. And taking into consideration um, operating costs in this environment, uh, let's even talk about fuel costs, it's no surprise that the world's airlines are unwilling or unable to continue pay escalating charges just to fly in and out of airports. It's an important point to consider if airlines themselves can no longer support aviation infrastructure, another avenue must be found and created. One alternative is government funding, but at a global level, national governments and local authorities are increasingly withdrawing from direct participation in airport management, which is increasingly seen as a specialized business that should operate on commercial principles. If we take Europe as an example, 43% of European airports are loss-making which European government today can continue funding such enterprises when there are other pressing social and economic issues? The recent global crisis has shown that private enterprise can create massive wealth when you look at Apple, Facebook, Microsoft, Louis Vuitton, Mercedes-Benz, while governments are holding unprecedented levels of public debt, accountability and responsibility. Continuing to invest taxpayer dollars and euros into long-term airport expansion projects is clearly not attractive in such an environment. The second challenge, which I've identified, is that the cost of delivering new airport infrastructure is high. Airports are no longer simple buildings which hold, period, hold people for short periods of time. They have become small cities, connected activities and shareholders, um, sorry, um, with, with a city of stakeholders and activities, all of them more and more integrated than ever before. I mentioned the figure of $110 billion, which is earmarked, earmarked for airport development in this region alone. These are projects which have urgent time pressures due to real demand and have long lead times for delivery. They are designed and planned now for the future. 
what will airline and passenger needs be in the future? In Dubai Airport's case, we have seen 54% growth in passengers from 2008 to 2012, and the knock-on effect of this continued growth on shopping, dining, lounges, baggage handling, car parks, immigration processes, on everything, actually, has been enormous. With this passenger growth has come growth in the importance of non-traditional sources of revenue to build a sustainable business, and a better understanding of where commercial activities should fit within airport planning and design. But the world hasn't stood still either, which is the third challenge. As well as increased passenger numbers and increased aircraft movements and larger aircraft, we see a more demanding passenger profile which is value conscious, brand conscious, mobile and connected, and more global in their outlook than ever before. Passengers who frequently use airports and travel longer distances have higher expectations of what airports should be, whether it is in the area of retail, customer service, food, lounges, comfort, entertainment. The modern traveler demands more convenience, faster, better, and more consistent levels of service, more personalization, products and services which are in tune with their demographic and reflect their aspirations and can be tailored to their needs. And in growing numbers, more premiumization, meaning higher value or exclusive products, which are not available anywhere else except maybe at the airport. Airport managers, therefore, have a responsibility and a strong incentive financially to engage 100% with passengers and business partners and ensure that we actively encourage a commercial environment which allows products and services to be present, be visible, and be successful. Airport customers, or passengers, by their very act of spending money on travel, are more likely to be of a higher than average income group, more likely to own more than one credit card or debit card, more likely to own a smartphone, and are more likely to be better educated. It is therefore an attractive proposition to respond to this evolving base. Current global statistics demonstrate that commercial revenue sources now account for 47% of all airport revenues on average around the world. It varies, of course, from region to region and airport to airport. In the case of Dubai, our stated objective is not to recover the cost of infrastructure from our airline partners, but instead to develop the full potential of retail and all commercial activity on the ground. And we have considerable success in this. We will hear soon the progress of Dubai Duty Free over 30 years and its value to Dubai's airport business and to Dubai itself. I mentioned earlier that from 2008 to 2012, passenger traffic at Dubai International grew by 54%. In that same period, Dubai Airport's revenues grew by 84%. And, but this has required a shift in mindset and a shift in priorities. Airports globally have traditionally been facility managers, obsessed with processes and governance, and historically maybe with less focus on the customer experience or financial returns. We are now very clearly as airport managers in the people business, also in the service business and in the results business. Dubai Airports' as airport managers have identified growing non-aeronautical activity as a core pillar of our corporate strategy and this is essential to fund continued expansion and sustainability of our model. Two years ago, Dubai Airports launched our master plan. It's a program with an investment of almost 8 billion US dollars uh, in Dubai International's infrastructure. And we'll see us welcoming 98 million passengers by 2020. We are planning almost 700,000 square meters of new floor space in new or improved facilities that will be delivered within a few years as well as improvements in, in cargo capacity, aircraft stands, and runway efficiency. Concourse A, which opened in January this year, is a key part of our growth plan and has lifted our capacity to 75 million passengers a year. This infrastructure is capital intensive, and these vital assets must be of such a standard that they can meet airline requirements as well as passenger requirements. Commercial activities, then, have taken center stage in driving this expansion and we are relying on the continued growth of retail and all commercial revenue for further aviation development. Care and attention was given to Concourse A's commercial space plan to ensure that the final space that we, set, that we see today was appropriate to the needs of Emirates A380 passengers. 
This meant higher standards of design in premium lounges, in retail, in services, and food outlets, for example. Taking this approach and mentality wider, this approach means that today, across the airport, passengers have a wider choice of reputable world-class food outlets catering for all profiles and all incomes. It means that there's a wider ch choice of trusted currency exchange services for regular travelers or for those who are less familiar with this region. It means that connecting passengers can book a hotel room inside the airport or a snooze cube in the case of Dubai International in order to sleep and refresh while waiting for flights. Service and sleep and revenue can go hand in hand. Our airport is a showcase of trusted brands and services which reflect the global nature of travel. And our airport is therefore a platform for opportunity and success. I mentioned this change in mindset and airports and indeed all service providers which operate in airports clearly have to stop getting in the way of the perfect experience. Instead, we must be active partners, creating the right spaces and the right environment for all customer-facing business to be successful and for operators and brands to realize their true potential. We do not talk about passive rents anymore, um, in Dubai airports at least. Instead, we talk of sharing success and sharing revenue by creating long-term, sustainable partnerships with specialists. Examples of this approach are found in partners who try hard to make a connection with our customers every single day, who use the airport as a platform to attract a, gl a growing, global, and influential audience, who aim to delight our passengers and business users at every opportunity, to inform them, to surprise them, to influence them, and to encourage them to spend more money inside our airport. Our customers are connected and they're aware. Therefore, they expect the airport to be connected to their needs as well. Airports, therefore, in my view, should be centers of commercial innovation and excellence and be the symbols of progress at the cutting edge of consumer trends, business practices, or technology. We cannot be imitations of shopping malls or food courts or free zones, but we should reflect our own unique needs as businesses. Airports and our commercial partners can and should redefine what world-class means for us within a model that works for us. And my concluding remark is that we are open for business. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eugene. Some very impressive statistics there, even by Dubai standards. And, um, you're on next, George. Thank you, Eugene, for a wonderful presentation. Well, my name, as you can see, is George Horan. I am part of the team at Dubai International Airport Duty Free Division. T today, I'll tell you a little piece about where we came from where we are presently, and where we expect to be in the future. If I can move this. In 1983, the government of Dubai decided to enhance the experience of passengers and airlines using Dubai Airport. So they consulted with Air Inter, the Irish Airport Authority, and asked them to come and look at the commercial activity at Dubai Airport in 1983. In 1983, the concessions at Dubai, the retail offer at Dubai Airport was on a concession basis which was had by 18 concessionaires. And these were primarily uh, local businessmen who had agencies for different product ranges, primarily cigarettes and alcohol and perfume, leather goods, watches and cameras. Because there were so many different operators at the airport, the offer itself lacked consistently, it lacked uniformity, and the government felt there was a need for change. So on the 20th of December, 1983, the government opened the new retail offer at Dubai Airport. And it was intended that this offer would be completely different from anything that was there before. It was meant to be bright, attractive. Uh, customers were meant to feel comfortable whilst they shopped with us. And of course, shopping had to be convenient. We had to offer good value for money. We had to offer a very good exchange service or after sales service. And the staff had to be well trained. <clears throat> Our mission statement was really to provide a first class service to passengers using Dubai Airport. 
and our vision was to promote Dubai Airport and to promote Dubai as a destination. In 1984, we had, 20, we had 3 million passengers and $20 million revenue. We've come a long way from, from, from that till now. And en route, we had um, the opening of Concourse 1, which happened in the year 2000. Traffic was growing dramatically at Dubai Airport from 1984 till the year 2000. In, the, in 1984, we had uh, 3 million passengers and in the year 2000, we had 12 million passengers. We had $20 million revenue in 1984, and now we had $200 million revenue in the year 2000. Here you can see the emphasis was an open, an open shopping environment, which meant the passengers felt free as they came through the shop. We had emphasis on the retail signage. We had emphasis on the boarding gate locations. So we didn't want the passengers to feel lost whilst they shopped at Dubai Airport. Along the way, we, the government identified uh, the advent of low-cost travel. So in, in 1997, uh, they opened Concourse 2, which was dedicated totally to low-cost travel. This proved to be a big success. And right now, of course, we have Fly Dubai, which is one of the biggest low-cost carriers in the, in the region, operating from Terminal 2 which is presently being revamped and will be dedicated totally to fly Dubai. In preparation for the huge growth which is about to take place, Dubai Duty Free realized the importance of our recruitment policies. We realized the importance of our training, training policies and we recognized the importance of taking care of our staff. We also identified clearly that we needed to be aligned uh, to the airport the Airport Authority's strategic plan for the year 2020. This meant we were, early, we were involved very early in the master planning along with the other stakeholders. And this, we think, has been very clearly manifested now, not all in Concourse B, but primarily in Concourse A. We worked very closely with the engineering division who managed the building of the airport. We have the staff at Dubai Duty Free all 5,700 of them, who worked very, very diligently to ensure the success of Dubai Airport and Dubai Duty Free. Here we see Concourse B now, as it's known, it was known as Concourse 2. And you can see it's quite an ornate place. Again, in the year 2000, we had 12 million passengers and $200 million revenue. In 2008, we had 29 million passengers and one billion US dollars in revenue. And here you can see our relationship with the vendors, really. We're working more closely with the suppliers. We're allowing them to be, have more hands-on in what happens in the space assigned to them in the shop. We encourage them to get involved in vendor support programs where they, they pay for the fit out and they pay for some of the staff which are dedicated to their product range. <laughs> We had to speed up the checkout processes in liquor and perfumes, which are our big volume areas. And we think we did things quite successfully in Concourse B. <clears throat> now I take you on to Concourse A, which is dedicated totally to the Airbus A380. And this, we think, is a wonderful success, primarily because there was such an involvement of all of the stakeholders from the very beginning. This year, we expect 66 million passengers to use Dubai Airport, and we expect to have revenue of 1.8 billion US dollars. So we think we're doing something which is relatively right. In Concourse A, the layout of the shop has been, has been as such that our core categories, such as perfume and cosmetics, were given a huge area as you enter the shop. Perfume and cosmetics accounts for 22% of revenue at Dubai Airport. Liquor and cigarettes, again, another keystone to our, of our operation, amounts to 24% of the revenue, and we have dedicated two areas, both for liquor and cigarettes, one in the east and one in the west. Food is a very important category for us, primarily into the Indian subcontinent, and we have two food stores within this environment. And of course, gold, because of the um, 
desire primarily of Indians to buy gold from a dowry point of view is, is very strategically located as you enter the shop. Here you see our gifts from Dubai offer. This we think is very important to give you a sense of place whilst you're in Dubai. It's positioned right at the entrance to the store and although it only accounts for 2% revenue, it's a very important feature for us in Dubai that we have this, this merchandise range here. It gives us a sense of place, as I say. Perfume and cosmetics, as I say, is a huge contributor to the buy duty free. We're working extremely closely now with the perfume houses, not just on margin, but on involvement by the house itself in what goes on. Each brand is clearly defined within the footprint of the shop. Fixtures and fittings have been made primarily in Europe and shipped to Dubai and installed. The lighting is very important, as you know, to these people. So the importance of the brand is reflected clearly in what goes on at Dubai Airport. And this is not because of Dubai Duty Free, it's because of the relationship between Dubai Duty Free and the brand itself. Gold, as I say, is also equally important. This is quite a, a flashy slide, really. The carpet is a bit, maybe OTT, but we think it adds a bit of color. We sell about three ton of gold every year, so it's important that it's clearly manifesting itself. Liquor and tobacco, again, 24% of revenue comes from liquor and tobacco. I'm showing this slide particularly to highlight the positioning of the car, the final surprise draw. This is a very important part of our marketing strategy at Dubai Duty Free. Today, I think we had our, our draw for 140, 140 million air draw, where we drew 1 million US dollars and we presented 1 million US dollars. This for us has been a huge success. We sell I think 5,000 tickets at 1,000 dirhams each. We generate 5 million dirhams worth of revenue, and we buy a million dollars for 3.685 or something. So the bit in the middle is profit. But this is not about the profit element. This is about the buy, the experience of coming to Dubai. Also here you can see clearly our new dig digital imagery. We have about 100, 100 screens uh, placed throughout the shop. And we have access to changing the, the message on these screens uh, by destination of aircraft, by if there are Chinese people in the shop, we can convert the message into Chinese language. So they're very important for us, and they're also a very important source of revenue. We haven't just been <coughs> solely relying on retailing at Dubai Airport. We have also tried to diversify the offer. And we think life is about diversification whilst keeping your eye on the core brands, of course. We have a currency exchange system at Dubai Airport, which is proving very profitable for us. And uh, we're a bit upset that Eugene is talking about multi-currency changes at Dubai Airport, but this is life, I guess. We have a dynamic currency conversion at the point of sale, where you can pay in your, your current, the currency of your country of origin. And we get a bit of margin there. As I said at the beginning, we're heavily involved with the vendors, and a lot of them pay big money just to have a prime position at Dubai Duty Free. We have a new uh, advertising strategy with this digital imagery, and it's proving very successful. And these reasons, amongst others, are why we are so successful. Of course, all, the, all this just doesn't happen. It's caused to happen. And we have a huge back office infrastructure. We just built a new warehouse and office environment where we have 6,000 square meters of office space. We have 27,000 square meters of warehousing space and a 9,000 square meter mezzanine area. We, su we supply Concourse A, it takes about 39% of the, 19% of the deliveries. Concourse B, 37% of the deliveries. And Concourse, Concourse C, 25% of the deliveries. The warehouse itself is completely automated. We store over 20,000 pallets and 27,000 min mini pallets. 95% of the merchandise is, is uh, stored and retrieved automatically. And we move about 500 pallets a day to the warehouse. And then, of course, we have the workforce. 
the most important element at the Buy Duty Free. We provide accommodation for our staff, and here we just bought 15 apartment blocks in Discovery Gardens. We have 735 apartments there, and we accommodate 2,300 of our employees in this, in this location. The convenience here is they're all staying together, so transportation is not a bigger problem as it used to be before. We have three e-learning centers here where the staff can access e-learning programs online. And when they pass the course, we, they get a certificate from the program organizer. We have three swimming pools here where the staff can swim and do what they like. And we have a gymnasium and we have a laundry. As part of our strategy from the very beginning, we have been striving to, to promote Dubai as a destination. We have a very, very active marketing campaign in the sporting field. We own the Dubai Tennis Championships, where each year for two weeks, the men's tour and the ladies' tour comes to Dubai in February. And last year, we had eight of the top 10 ladies playing and six of the top 10 men players. It's been awarded the best tournament of the series for the last nine years out of 10. We are also involved in the Dubai International Film Festival. We are supporters of the Dubai Shopping Festival. We support racing in Ascot. We sponsor the Irish Derby in Dublin. And the newest string on our bow is we're having the World Dart Champions coming to Dubai at the end of this month. Dubai Duty Free itself has been recognized several times at a, at a symposium in Cannes, where all the world uh, leading industry is judged. And last year, we were judged as being the best airport retailer in the world for 2012. This gives us great confidence and boosts the morale of our staff. And we, we, it's nice to know that people recognize what you're doing globally. And it's a nice thank you message to get. Here is a, a chart which shows our annual sales growth. And you can see how impressive it really is. In 2013, you, you see we will have 58 million passengers using Dubai Airport, and we will have sales of 1.6 billion US dollars. And to the future, where are we going from here? Well, on the 27th of uh, October, the Department of Civil Aviation, or the Dubai Airport Company, has decided that it needs to open uh, the, uh, the facility at Dubai World Central, which is an airport which is just built, partially built, on the way to Abu Dhabi. From the 27th of October, there will be two airlines uh, flying out of that airport, servicing destinations in Eastern Europe and in Saudi Arabia. When the airport is finished, and it may take up to 15 years to finally totally finish it, it will have five runways. It will have a capacity of 160 million passengers. And we think it'll be, it'll be a city within a city. Dubai Airport presently occupies 14 square kilometers of ground space. This will occupy 140 square kilometers of ground space. So you can see it will be enormous. And it will be a wonderful institution to have in Dubai. At the existing airport, the plan for now really, and for the future is that Emirates Airlines will use concourse A, B, and C. Terminal 2 will be used exclusively by Fly Dubai. And they're building a new concourse called Concourse D, which will be used by all other airlines. And again, we have been working very closely with the authorities at Dubai Airport to ensure that the requirements of the Dubai Duty Free are adequately met at this new airport. And this is a layout of what's going to happen there. And while it's difficult to read it, from here at least, you can see all our core, our core brands, our core product range is very efficiently located and well catered for, we think. <clears throat> Looking further into the future, you can see in 2013, we expect to have revenue of 1.8 billion US dollars from 66 million passengers. And by 2020, 
we expect to have revenue of 3 billion US dollars from 100 million passengers. So we think the future looks bright, especially for Dubai International Airport, for the stakeholders at Dubai International Airport, and I guess for Dubai Duty Free. Thank you all very much. <laughs> Excellent, George. Thank you very much for that. I'd like to uh, invite the audience to ask any questions. Do we have any uh, retail questions? If you could uh, raise your hand. No? Perhaps, uh, perhaps I'll ask one. Oh, gentleman in the front row, if someone has uh, got a microphone. Peter Besekra, Pembrey Airport, UK. Um, with all the A380s um, coming on stream, would that be a uh, kind of competition, the onboard duty-free sales uh, in terms of liquor, perfumes, etc., to the ground facilities? I'm sorry, I didn't catch the question. I didn't get, I didn't get, is the question for me or for Eugene? Uh, uh, the question was to yourself. Um, I can't hear, I'm sorry. Yep, uh, with, uh, my question was with all the A380s coming on stream and all the other white bodies that you've got, and the um, onboard duty-free sales in the future, would that impact on the ground duty-free sales? Well, with the advent of the Airbus A380, as you know, it's a huge aircraft. And I think the issue on all aircraft, not just the Airbus A380, is the weight element being carried by these aircraft. And of course, the range of merchandise which can be offered from the in-flight cart, shall we call it, is very limited. So I don't think it would be a serious threat to the offer on the ground, which can carry so much more. I think maybe there could be some type of link between the operator on the ground and the airline itself, where the airline could communicate with the ground network and order in advance of arrival at Dubai Airport in particular, and pick up as they arrive into Dubai or pick up in transit through Dubai Airport. We're looking at what's going on really globally, we don't, do not see a huge threat from in-flight sales, to be honest. Any others? Perhaps I could ask one before we uh, finish. No more than two weeks ago, I had the opportunity to speak to some of the team um, redeveloping the new Tom Bradley terminal in Los Angeles. It's not quite finished yet. It's not operational. Um, but it's nearly there. And um, their guys were telling me that they've decided to do things a bit differently to how they did it in the past, in that once you're through security, if you wish to do so, you can go straight to the gate, or if you so choose, you can go through all the shops to lead you to the gate. And if you've taken the option to go straight to the gate, but decide you have got time to go and buy that bottle of perfume or whatever, um, they're installing uh, fast travelators in both directions to rush you back to the shops and then back to the gate. I wondered if you thought it would catch on or whether they were just playing crazy. My God, heresy. <laughs> I think this would be a very, very disadvantageous thing to do from a commercial point of view. For us, it's vital that the passenger goes, walks, has to walk through the shop. Because if the shop is on the foot, footprint of the passenger, there's a good chance he or she will buy something. If you give the chance, the passenger, the, the opportunity to circumvent the shop, I think it will be detrimental to revenue. We're seeing this already where passengers have access into the day, Emirates lounges in particular. They choose to go directly into the lounge and very, very infrequently do they come back out of the lounge to shop. So we're now in the dilemma, how do we actually tap into these passengers who are in the lounge and have not shopped? But the importance of non-aeronautical revenue is so important really I'm astonished that they would take this course of action and not really channel them at least through the shop. Just give them the opportunity to spend some money. Okay, thanks George and Eugene and uh, you ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.